Good to see you on a Wednesday night. I'm sure glad you're here tonight. I really am. Thank you for being here, joining us for a time of worship and a time in the Word. And I think there are some people here for the very first time, and also maybe some joining us online for the very first time. Can we just give it up for those folks that are here for the first time? Awesome. We are really, really glad that you're here with us tonight. And as Crystal mentioned, um, those of you that have the rhythm of coming on a Wednesday night to be part of our Wednesday evening service, we will not have Wednesday evening service next week. And so if you come next week and nobody's here, don't think that the second coming of the Lord has happened and you missed it, okay? <laughs> No, you haven't missed it. You, it. We just won't be here. Um, and, and actually, that's in lieu of Friday night. So we're deferring our Wednesday really to Friday night, which is Good Friday. I sure hope that you'll join us for Good Friday services. I just think the Good Friday services are so very important leading into the Easter celebration weekend. And so we have, as, as was mentioned, we have two options for Good Friday, we have uh, the 5 o'clock, and then we also have 7. We also have a synchronized 7 o'clock uh, service in Spanish as well. That will be on campus here. So bring a friend with you. Come. This, the uh, Good Friday service is always a very, very special time in the presence of the Lord as we remember the sacrifice of Christ. And I think it's so important. That's one of the reasons why we've been talking through the last week of Christ's life this, this month leading up to Easter on Wednesday nights because I think before we can fully appreciate the celebration of Easter, we have to understand the last week of Christ's life and the sacrifice that he made. And so that's why we've been talking through this, the last week of Christ's life. Let me ask you a question. Do you have any tasks either at home or work that you just don't like doing? Any tasks... Even if you love your job, this is what I've discovered, even if you just absolutely love your job, there are usually at least some tasks that you don't enjoy. It might be filling out reports, it could possibly be responding to emails, or maybe attending long, boring meetings. You know, that you, it's especially when you know you have lots of work to do, and then this meeting just kind of goes on and on. Can I, t can I tell you a little secret I'm telling on myself now? I, I taught in the public school system for 15 years prior to coming on staff here, and one of the things that was so difficult for me was the long staff meetings that we would have. Sometimes I, I felt like we were just doing staff meetings because it was a requirement so the, the principal administrators could check the box and say we had the meeting and like that. And shame on me, I used to call those meetings a pooling of ignorance. Isn't that awful? What a rotten attitude. But that's what I call them nonetheless. But maybe for you, maybe, you know, there's some tasks uh, at work or maybe at home, maybe like cleaning the shower or bathtub or toilet. I told my wife, I don't have the toilet cleaning chromosome. It's not my fault. But there's, you know, or maybe it could be doing dishes or folding laundry or pulling weeds or something like that. So how do you deal with these tasks, the ones at work or at home that you don't, you don't especially like doing? Do you delegate them to somebody else or maybe put them off as long as possible or perhaps you just don't do them at all, hoping that nobody will notice or that somebody will come along and just magically, you know, kind of do the task for you? Well, in the last week of Jesus' life, he takes on a task that nobody else wanted to do. That's right. He washed the dirty feet of the 12 disciples. A task that would normally have been reserved for the lowest of servants. And as we reflect on the final week of the life of Jesus, what I'm calling the most important week of the most important person who ever lived, as we look at this final week, 
um, we are reflecting on the question, what would I do if I was made aware that I only had one week to live? Because the reality of it is, even though the disciples were kind of out of the loop in regards to the fact that this was the final week of Jesus' life, Jesus was very much aware that this was his final week, and that'll be reflected in, um, in the passage of Scripture that we take a look at tonight. He was very much aware of what was going on, so he knew... And it causes me to think, what, what would I do if I knew I just had a short period of time to live? I think that if, if knowing that, we would, you know, we, we, we would really think about who we would talk to, what we would say, how we would interact, things that we might do, things like that. But washing dirty feet most certainly would not be at the top of the list for any of us. It might not even be on the list at all, Right? But it was on his list. Earlier in the week of Jesus' last week, he entered into Jerusalem amidst a crowd that cheered him as a victorious king, Messiah. He'd also entered the temple, which we talked about last week, and he, he chased out the money changers and those who bought and sold animals for animal sacrifice. During that week, he healed the sick. He taught important truths and he spoke of the end times. In other words, he was downloading to his followers all of the important information that he felt he needed to download to them before he left. Knowing as Jesus did, this was his last week, everywhere he went, everything that he did and said was extremely important. No words or actions were wasted. These were the final moments that he could spend with his disciples, and the last opportunity to impart to them things that he wanted them to know. Just one day before his crucifixion, Jesus sits down with his disciples to eat a Passover meal. I think the act of sitting down and eating a meal with his disciples reveals the humanity of Jesus, to share a meal with his disciples, to carry on conversation. And so, the humanity of Jesus just really shines through at this, at this juncture of his life. And we want to take a look at what happened on that fateful night when he gathered his disciples together. And it's the, the uh, gospel that we're going to be looking at this evening is the book of John, chapter 13. And as, as I mentioned, I love this section of Scripture from John 13 all the way through John 17, which speaks of the events of this evening, this last meal, last time with his disciples. And it goes like this. Now, before the feast of, of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. And there's, there's that key passage that tells us that he knows, he knows what's about to happen. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. As we read this passage, realizing that everything he did at this point was significant, we ask, why would he take these precious moments to take up a towel and a basin of water and to stoop down and to wash the feet of his disciples? And that's what we're going to seek to understand together tonight. So the first lesson is this. He washed the disciples' feet to teach them a lesson in humility, how to humble themselves. Luke gives us an interesting detail about the conversation that took place among the disciples that night. 
And in Luke 22, he says this, a dispute arose among them, that's among the disciples, as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. So while the disciples were arguing over who would be the greatest, Jesus quietly slips from the table, takes off his outer garment, gets a towel and a basin of water, and begins to wash their feet. A timely message in humility for these position-seeking men and a timely message for all of us. Did you notice that even Judas was among those whose feet Jesus washed? The very man that had betrayed Jesus, Jesus also chose to wash his feet. I think it's remarkable. Paul would later write these words in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. That's, this is what Paul was speaking about, taking uh, the form of a bondservant to stoop and to wash the feet of the disciples. That's a servant's task. But Jesus did it. When Jesus laid aside his outer garment, it was a type of him laying aside his glory as the very Son of God, and also a type of him laying down his life. And the towel that he girded himself with was like taking upon himself the form of a servant. Paul said he emptied himself. He emptied himself. And I think it's so important for us to understand and grasp the reality of these truths before we celebrate the resurrection and before we, you know, Easter is here, let's celebrate. I think it's important that we take a moment to realize that Jesus emptied himself. He poured himself out. He took on the form of a bondservant. Is anyone else blown away by the fact that Jesus washed the disciples' feet? I'm blown away by this. He is the very Son of God. If you read John's account in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. God was made flesh. And another of the New Testament writers writes of him and says that Jesus is God manifest in flesh. And here we have God, the very Son of God, stooping to wash the filthy, dirty feet of the disciples. That's humility, folks. At the highest level, that's humility. Some people see humility as weakness. Some also may see humility as putting yourself down. It's neither. In my devotional reading, I found this biblical definition of humility, and it's found a couple of verses prior to the ones that I just read in Philippians, and it, it goes like this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, listen to this, value others above yourself. That's a definition of humility. Valuing others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And so we learn from this true humility then is valuing others and seeking to meet other people's needs. How impacting would it be for those around us if we put that into practice in our life? You talk about countercultural. 
That, this, is, this is completely revolutionary, countercultural, this idea of putting others before ourselves, of serving others. If we, if we became just as interested in meeting the needs of others as we are about having our own needs met, what a difference that would make in the lives of the people around us, and ultimately, I believe, even in our own lives. This is what Paul is saying. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And this is what Christ is demonstrating when he took the towel and the basin of water and he washed the disciples' feet. The Bible has so much to say about this topic. It, it, I mean, just do a deep dive sometime in the Scripture yourself looking at the humility and how important it is as it relates to a Christ follower. But I'd like to take a look at just one more verse before we move on, and this one is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. It says this, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. In other words, he's saying, wear humility like a garment. Put it on. Wear it like a garment. Why, why put it on? I'll tell you why. Because in our natural human condition, it's not there. We've got to put it on. We've got to have the discipline of putting it on like a garment, the writer here says. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. How many of you want grace in your life. You know what grace is, right? Grace is the unmerited favor of God. That is favor that is not earned. And we want grace in our lives. Here's a key to getting grace in our lives. That is, that is to humble ourselves. Humble yourselves. Therefore, he goes on to say, under the mighty hand of God, so that at pro the proper time, he may exalt you. The second lesson that we learn is this. He washed the disciples' feet to teach us to serve one another. During the time of Christ, it was customary for a host to have his servant wash the feet of his guests. It's interesting that none of the disciples offered to wash each other's feet. They may have been willing to, to wash Christ's feet, which becomes apparent when Peter has an interaction with the Lord, when the Lord comes to wash his feet, and Peter says, no, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Uh, let me wash you. And so it, they, they may have been willing to wash Christ's feet, but apparently none of them were willing to wash one another's feet. Because remember the, ar the argument they were having about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And so, there, you know, there's no, there's no way they're going to, to stoop to the point of washing each other's feet. It kind of caused me to f ask myself this question, and maybe you can ask yourself this question as, as well. It caused me to ask myself the question, whose feet am I unwilling to wash? In other words, who am I unwilling to humble myself to? Kind of gets you to think, doesn't it? When we read Matthew's account of the Last Supper, an incredible truth surfaces. Throughout the evening, it becomes evident that Jesus is not the one being served. He's the one who's serving. I never really caught that before reading through these passages carefully, that Jesus isn't the one being served. He's the one who's serving. Jesus selected the place. He designated the time. He set the meal in order. Notice the verbs that showed Jesus' actions that night. He took, he blessed, he broke, he gave, and of course, he washed. It's obvious that Jesus is the one doing the serving. Just prior to his final week, Jesus had taught his followers this truth in Matthew 20. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. 
And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is so countercultural, and for many of us, it's so unnatural. Yet this is the culture that Jesus is seeking to establish among his followers, a culture of serving. Isn't it interesting that one of the last things that Christ does with his disciples is to serve them a meal and to wash their feet? Talk about lasting impressions. You know, that the last encounter that you have with someone is going to stick with you. And the last encounter that these followers of Christ, these disciples have with Jesus is this one of him feeding them and washing their feet. Peter gives us this instruction in 1 Peter 4, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And so, the, you know, the Scripture talks a lot about stewardship. And in this, in this point, we often associate that to, to finance and, and, and to money. And, and certainly it applies there. But here it's talking about stewarding the gifting that God has placed within you. Stewarding the gifting well. And one of the ways that we steward the giftings that God has given to us, the talents, the abilities, and the giftings that God has placed within us, one of the ways we steward it well is by serving others. By serving others. God has given you a gift. He's given you a talent, a position. Use it to serve others. Again, how impacting would it be to those around us if we put this into practice in our daily lives? What would happen if we begin to serve those that God has placed in the sphere of our lives? Begin by asking God to show you areas where you can serve others. Perhaps you could begin with this at home, maybe with your friends, work associates, neighbors, or with your church family here. And finally, the third lesson is this. Jesus washed the disciples' feet to teach us to show God's love in practical ways. To show His love in practical ways. Jesus intended for His disciples to follow His example. After He washed their feet, here's, listen to what He said to them. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. And so Jesus is saying, uh, here's, here's what I've done. I've, I've, I've started this culture of humbling yourself, of serving others. I want you to carry this culture on. You see, in Jesus' day, washing someone's feet was a very practical thing to do because people walked everywhere in either bare feet or sandals. The roads and paths were rough and their feet would be cut and bruised, sore and filthy. Washing them was not just a nice gesture, but it was a needed service. One writer said this, kindness is simply being useful to another. Kindness is being useful. And so we've been asking the question, why did Jesus wash the disciples' feet? Would you like to know the deep theological answer to that question? The deep theological answer to the question, why did Jesus wash the disciples' feet, is because they were dirty. They were dirty. He was, the truth was, he was meeting a very practical need. 
a very practical need. I, I want to end tonight revealing a very important truth in this story. I want to take you back to the first verse in John 13. This time I want, I, I want you to listen to these words in John 13, 1, where it says, it was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. And watch this, having loved his own, who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. I, I want you to hang on to that phrase. He showed them the full extent of his, of his love. After Jesus finished washing the disciples' feet, he says this to them in John 13, 34, a new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. Hold on to that phrase as well. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So think about this. Prior to washing the disciples' feet, the Scripture said he now showed them the full extent of his love. And then after washing their feet, he tells them to love one another as I have loved you. Between these two phrases, which talk about Jesus showing God's love, we have him washing the disciples' feet. See, the message is clear. How was he showing them the full extent of his love? By washing their feet. If I were to ask you this question, what is Christ's greatest display of love? You would probably without hesitation say when he died on the cross for our sins, right? And I would agree with that. The greatest display, the, the John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's, that, we would say that's his greatest display of love. But I want to ask you this question. Isn't it true that more than likely, none of us will ever be called upon to die for someone else as Christ did? More than likely, we are not going to be called upon to die for someone else. So how are we going to show God's love? If He showed His love by dying on the cross, how are we going to show God's love? You see, when he said, love one another as I have loved you, I don't think he was talking about us dying for each other. I think he was talking about what he had just done when he washed the disciples' feet. I think what he's saying is this. We show God's love by humbling ourselves, serving others, and meeting practical needs just as he did when he washed the disciples' feet. Does that make sense? Does that make sense tonight? As, as we conclude here tonight, here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to prayerfully consider some practical ways that you could show God's love by serving others. And so I'm going to ask you to just kind of set everything aside. Let's, let's just close our eyes for this moment of privacy. As we think about Christ's example, how he humbled himself, how he served others, how he met practical needs. And I would say, Lord, how can I show your love in this manner? How can I show your love in practical ways to those around me? You know, it, it, it could begin really, really, really close to home. It could begin with your spouse. It could begin with your children. It could begin with your, your family. How can we show God's love in practical ways? You know, some of you may have 
may be familiar with the teaching, the five love languages. Essentially, the five love languages says we, you know, we all have a primary love language, a way in which we receive love and it's most meaningful to us. And so the, the point of the teaching is to discover the love language of those around you, your, your spouse, your children, and to begin to show love to that individual using their primary love language, the way that they best perceive that they're being loved. And it, it, it becomes very practical in that sense. And that's, what, that's kind of what we're talking about here tonight. We're talking about how can I show the love of God to those around me in a very practical, meaningful way. And while we're pondering that and while we're opening our hearts to hear the, the Holy Spirit speaking into our lives, I also want to make an appeal to those of you that are here tonight that maybe you've never opened your heart to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to give you that opportunity here tonight. Please don't leave this service tonight without having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And in just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer inviting Christ to come into our lives. And if you've never prayed that prayer, I'm not going to embarrass you, ask you to come up to the front, but right where you're sitting, if you want to pray that prayer with us, I'll actually lead that prayer. And if you want to pray that prayer with us, just slip your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor Jim. I want to pray that prayer. I want to invite Christ to come into my life. Are you here tonight? All right. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand as well. And over here, God bless you. I see that hand. Anybody else say, that's me. I want to pray that prayer. All right. I see your hand, sir. God bless you. Awesome. What a great decision you folks are making tonight. And for those of you that lifted your hand, pray that prayer with us. Just say something along these lines. Just say, Lord, thank you for loving me so much that you would endure this week of passion and finally you would you would lay your life down by dying on the cross in my place. What love. And Lord, today I invite you to come into my life as my Lord and Savior. Would you forgive me of my sins, of my past wrongdoings? Would you cleanse me, God? And Lord, in place of those things, would you put the Holy Spirit within my life so that I can continue to have relationship with you for the rest of my life. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching this message uh, from the Highlands. Our goal here at the Highlands is to become people of the Word. We love the Word of God, and the message you just heard was filled with scriptures that we pray would be an encouragement to you. Make sure that you share if you were encouraged by this message with others to help us get God's Word out. Uh, if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, I want to encourage you. We have messages and content every week that would encourage you and help you grow in your faith. And then make sure you uh, just like this video. And we want to continue to get the gospel out to as many people as we know how to as we're able to. This is great technology. Thank you for joining us on YouTube. We pray that you're encouraged. Pray that you have a great week and that you would live out what you just heard in your daily life.